Welcome to 30 Minutes Promoting Unity in Diversity with Wani Angerer in Moving Cultures. Greetings from Bangkok, Thailand. And let's celebrate unity and diversity with the post for the International Women's Day 2022, saying no to injustice, saying no to discrimination, saying no to stereotypes, saying no to injustice and bringing the opportunity to collaborate and celebrate as a global family. Our guest number 174 of this series is a very beautiful girl, lady, woman that is very close to my heart. And she comes from South Africa. She was based in Thailand for a while. And now she's back to Korea because she was also living in Korea some time back. Her name is Marcia Peshke. Hola, Marcia. ¿Cómo estás? How are you? Hello, Emani. Thank you so much for having me. I am feeling good today, and I'm very excited to share the space with you. Thank you, Marcia, for accepting the invitation to talk about your life, your experiences, and what are you preparing for 2022? I know you are a person that communicates not only verbally, but with the body, the mind, the space, the energy, so many ways that you have to gravitate around that world that is called communication. Let's first tell us who is Marcia Peshke. So I am, as you've said, someone who is uh, interested in both the word and the body. Um, and I feel like my projects constantly bring these two together as ways of healing and exploring the self who a person is. Um, so I am an educator, I'm a movement artist and a writer, and I believe that all of these different ways of working can come together. And uh, especially as an educator, I try to um, have some kind of impact on my students and on people in general, um, encouraging all of them to represent and speak for themselves. So a large part of my creative work and my professional work speaks to that, um, to people being able to make their own spaces and represent themselves. You are the result of a multicultural union and you come from a very strong society as South Africa. Let's talk about your ancestry and your family history, Marcia. How do that has influenced the person you are today? Um, so I, uh, I personally identify as a black woman of color. I, I also refer to myself as biracial. Um, I've also said I'm colonized and colonizer in certain performance spaces. Um, and I would say that my racial identity has made me very uh, aware of um, the racial dynamics in South Africa which I would say it's still strained um, between different groups of people. Um, so it informs how I work in that I'm aware of my privileges um, as a teacher and as an artist. And when I, I work with groups of vulnerable people, I try to be conscious of why I'm in that space. I try to be conscious of other people having voices and of being a guest in those spaces. Um, so it definitely informs how I work with other people, um, being aware of my privileges as well. Um, the fact that I'm able to travel um, in these times is also a great privilege. Um, and it, I feel, allows me to also speak up for South Africa um, I try to be careful of that as well, because I cannot represent everyone in South Africa. But I feel that as a woman and a woman of color, um, it's very important to help others climb up the ladder um, and to show that women of color are complex, um, that we have stories, we have things we are interested in. Um, that we don't always have to be resilient. We can have moments where we feel very strong emotions 
And at the same time, we are strong people as well. Um, so it's something that I try to be conscious of um, when creating work. You come from a family of very strong women and they all have made statements and they continue to do that in the actuality. What can you tell us about the influences of your grandmother, your mother and your sister? Um, so yes, I want to repeat what you say, um, that the women in my family are very strong. Um, they are resourceful. Um, and growing up, I feel like that was very important for me, the, the idea of being resourceful, um, being able to create with having not much, maybe materially, um, and still being able to produce. Uh, I would say that my mother, I grew up seeing her being resourceful, and that was important for me as an artist, um, always finding a way to, to overcome uh, challenges. And I think as an artist uh, in this time, having to work with many restrictions, we have to be resourceful. We, we are sometimes now performing online um, the performance space is now uh, online and maybe in some cases in person with a number of restrictions. Um, my grandmother's kindness and sarcasm was always something that I appreciated and her observation of people as well. Um, she would sit on her porch and she would say, uh, watching people, she would say, this is free television. <laughs> so I appreciated um, how she observed people, how she, um, everything sort of just felt slowed down and slowing down and seeing what's in front of you, being comfortable in your own company um, as well is something that I deeply appreciate and I try to do. And I think it helps me to be mindful. Um, I have two sisters, um, a twin sister and an older sister, and I see elements of uh, my grandmother and my mother in them as well with how hard they work. Um, also navigating being parents. Uh, there are four boys. I have four nephews. Um, so I'm the aunt that is traveling. <laughs> um, and so this, I, I belong to a group of women who really emphasize the idea of maybe building your own table if there is not a table to sit at, that you look at what you have, you adapt, and then you create. And so I'm most proud of that. I think your grandmother understood the power of dealing with human talent because uh, she saw people as an asset. And I think that gave the opportunity to all of you to definitely understand that wealth is a combination of what is material and uh, what is the connections with the people in the community. She was a community leader. And this is the reason why you practically hold that flat with you. Let's talk about community work, Marcia, and uh, how the global experiences you had had teaching overseas and coming back to South Africa and going out and coming back to South Africa is giving you a more broader perspective of life. Yes, I, uh, well, before leaving South Africa, I was a junior lecturer um, at a university teaching drama studies. Um, and so that sense of community was very important because I was involved in directing, working in productions with students. Um, and so I felt that I had that in me that was already established, but I wanted so much more and to, to challenge myself in different ways. Um, and so the first country that I uh, went to was South Korea and, and there's so many challenges in terms of cultural differences and things and you begin to ask yourself how do I make deep connections with people who um, have different cultural practices and I, I heard this thought being repeated all the time you've got to put yourself out there which is a scary thing to do 
but so necessary if you want to have these experiences. And so I did this with the dance community and the poetry community in Korea. Um, and I started really thinking about this idea of listening to other people, um, still being able to make connections, even though there are differences and to acknowledge that those differences exist to see people's differences. And um, this flourished within me even more when I moved to Thailand, where I worked very closely with uh, Project C, um, which it, its greatest strength is a collabor collaboration between artists, um, listening to each other um, and healing through the work that we were doing. And so two and a half years of doing that work really inspired me. And I felt that I wanted to take this scary, another scary jump into doing, doing more independently, taking what I'd learned um, and seeing the leader in myself and, and being able to create my own projects. Um, and so my return to South Africa was meant to be one month before moving on to Korea, but this turned into seven months. And this was a happy accident for me because I started getting into the projects I wanted to do. Um, and one of the major projects I was involved in was for the Makanda National Arts Festival, uh, formerly the Grahamstown National Arts Festival. Mm -hmm. And I worked with a wonderful performer. Um, his name is Steer Kali, and he works at Wits University in Johannesburg, and he is a facilitator for a program called Drama for Life. Uh, together, we did a project called Enact Memory Archive, which was a movement piece looking at who is, what is the face of a victim and a perpetrator um, in South Africa? when it comes to violence against women. And in order to do that, we, we had to look at the behaviors, the social and cultural behaviors that are expected of men and women. Um, we worked very closely together and we both sort of looked at our own narratives as people, what was expected of us. And we created this beautiful project together that was performed at the festival. Um, I would like to share maybe a minute from that perf performance, uh, a minute from the video. Fantastic. Um, so I will do that now.
Yes, so uh, in that uh, section of the performance, it was looking at accessing memories and behaviors uh, that inform how men and women are expected to behave. Um, so that production sort of really represented for me the direction that I want to continue to go in, uh, which is collaborative work, um, which keeps looking at important issues such as gender-based violence. Um, so, so far, that is what my journey has looked like. Marcia, when we talk about uh, social issues and also mental health problems, uh, let's talk about the power of uh, the arts to release issues they are in the subconscious and that sometimes is no way to let them go out and i think that's one of the greatest powers of art what is your experience on this field so i would definitely say that whether it be in the form of writing or movement art creates a space where you can explore uh feelings and emotions that you may have hidden whether that be your own choice or pressure from your uh, social setting. Um, I would like to say that I was part of a publication um, called, uh, from a publishing company called Chasing Dreams Company. Um, and the, we did a poetry book which looked at mental health. Um, and it had artists from all around the world. Um, and we just having the opportunity to have your work published and then um, being able to share it with people, it gives them permission to speak up about the things that they are experiencing. So I think that's a major part of what the arts does. It gives people permission um, to explore who they are um, to think about why certain unhealthy behaviors are familiar to them and maybe to work on becoming familiar with behaviors or things that are more healthy. Um, so in my personal experience, uh, I, I've gone through stages of creative work where I feel like I've been allowed to uh, talk about my own experiences and I will say that audiences at the end of a performance or show, uh, people from the audience will often come up to you and say, I didn't think about this before, but it's challenging me. So even if the audience leaves with that, leaves with feeling challenged, that's important because then it allows them to question their perceptions of themselves and of other people as well. So I think that is the power of the arts, um, allowing you to think about how you perceive things and giving yourself permission to um, speak up about issues that you may be going through. Yes, when we also talk about movement, it's the possibility for the audience to actually generate some connection with the physical body of the artist and uh, reproduce, even so without moving, the moment the brain observes that movement, it goes into your system. I think this is the great thing about tribal movements because that has uh, been printed into our system. And believe it or not, when you have a performance and you go and connect with the audience, that part of the body and the subconscious get activated. Let's talk about energy and connections, Marcia. Yes, um, I would say it, it almost, especially if you're watching a movement performance, it almost feels like uh, walking into a sacred space where there are so many possibilities. Um, so for an audience walking into that space, they have a chance to tap into that energy, which is maybe so different. Um, imagine your audience coming from different spaces or different, um, from spaces where they expect it to be, spaces that are maybe so restricted or they have to carry themselves in certain ways. And suddenly in a performance space, 
all of that is challenged and, and there's this ability to connect with each other. And you see the, the perform performers connecting with each other in, in an intimate way, um, in a way where they've given permission for their bodies to touch and to exchange energy. Um, there's consent to do that. There's listening to each other in nonverbal ways. And so the audience gets to, to see that. And again, maybe everything within them is challenged because they see different ways of communicating. And I think it's so healthy for people in any kind of relationship, romantic or family relationships, to look at how you communicate with each other, how your communication is maybe influenced by the way in which you grew up. And then to think about um, how to have healthy exchanges with people. I'm going to talk now about two different issues that are related. The first one is the inner child that you are practically mentioning at the moment. And then we're going to talk about body expression in public spaces. I had the opportunity to see you perform one of the pieces when you are in a public transportation in a public place. And it's actually a reflection of what you were just talking about at the moment, that whatever you do doesn't matter in your private public space is a reflection of how your inner child was brought up, nurtured, looked after, or neglected. Let's talk about the inner child. Yes, um, so the inner child, I believe, will affect your behavior as an adult. Um, this can be whether you were allowed to play as a child, whether you were nurtured, uh, observing your parents' communication styles, all of this comes into who you are as an adult. And I think for many people, um, what's challenging is that they ask, is it possible for me to reparent myself? Is it possible to continue to play or is the idea of playing or discovering or exploring a childish thing. And I think I like the word childlike. To be childlike is a beautiful thing. Um, it means that as an adult, you can still explore, you can still play, um, you explore others, you explore spaces. Um, and what's interesting is that as an educator, um, working with teenagers, I, I see this where uh, students, especially in Korea, have very high expectations um, in terms of their academic work. And it can mean putting play and exploration aside. Um, and I might do things in the classroom where I ask my students to tell me how they feel or what their opinion is on something. And that can be very challenging um, for anyone to say, this is how I feel about something personally outside of social or cultural expectations. This is how I feel. Um, and so it's very interesting to engage with that. And I try to create many of those opportunities in my classroom to allow my students to explore and discover and to believe that it's not just the final or end product that is important. Um, and this is one thing that I learned in uh, my creative work in Thailand, um, the process of creating a performance, the process of connecting with each other, exploring each other's ideas or feelings that was really important for me. And so um, it's something that I, continue to do in any other creative project. I want to give others the chance to explore. So I try to, to use activities or games um, in rehearsal or in the classroom that allow for that. And then I want everyone to be able to share their thoughts on how they felt doing those things, whether it was strange um, to warm up by bouncing a ball around or whether it felt liberating or freeing in some way. Um, and I try to use that in my language as well. When I speak to people, how did you feel? How does your heart feel today? And you instantly see uh, this look on someone's face where they're confused 
because you're asking them something that they don't hear every day or they're so used to giving specific answers to things. Um, so the healing of the inner child or allowing your inner child to guide you in your adult life, that's still something that's very important. Yeah, you're also uh, just going to a topic that is extremely important, that is understanding what well-being is and also what a holistic perception of life is. And it's about remembering that the emotional side of ourself and the rational side of ourself have different uh, objectives and work. And we, like you, you were mentioning your experience with the Korean students, they neglect the emotional side and they turn to the rational one and overwork that. And then that possibility of connections gets on hold. And it's like you turn off the switch. And then uh, many other issues like health problems, mental problems, uh, communication problems, and uh, a lot of difficulties get on the way. And the person start to, to figure out what's going on and they start to consume uh, alcohol, drugs, or any other kind of things that will help them to stimulate once again that part of the body that has been mute. Let's talk about a holistic life from a perspective of a creator, of a created person. And, uh, and this is a journey we all go through as humans. We need to go through that process of uh, misguided sense and destruction in order to come back to our center and our balance. Talk to us about those experiences, Marcia. Um, so I would say that it's, um... Personally, for myself, I've had to work on this idea of um, what it means to have discipline and freedom, which sounds very similar to um, maybe the rational mind and the creative mind. And I, I feel like I've had to work on existing in both, um, especially as a creative person where I have uh, beautiful ideas I want to explore and at the same time, I need to see myself as a brand. So I feel like in life, there is this um, constant need to work on the idea of moderation existing between both worlds maybe. Um, what's worked for me is um, what other people might call journaling or, or writing myself. So I do this in my creative work where I, explore uh, different ideas or themes and it works in my personal life as well um, in the form of journaling where I reflect on what I'm grateful for. Um, I face myself by writing down what I feel. I sit with those feelings. I allow them to visit me and then I need to decide who I am after um, that experience. And this idea of facing yourself, it is a very difficult one. Um, very difficult because it means being honest. Um, and the most important relationship you will probably have in your life is the one with yourself. Um, and so to be honest with yourself is hard and, and you might resist at first and this might take you down the road to um, unhealthy behaviors, maybe consuming things that will distract you. Um, and that's, that will probably happen. You will probably have moments like that. But I think establishing some sort of routine, routine can be healthy, uh, establishing some sort of way of working with yourself, being honest with yourself, um, finding things that make you feel alive and then saying yes to those things. Um, the creative things that I do, writing, movement, it helps me to feel alive, um, especially with movement. I sometimes feel myself as an educator, maybe giving in to certain expectations, having to carry myself a certain way, which is understandable. Um, and then movement allows me to check in with my body, um, recognize how I am feeling. And then very importantly, when I move, 
I always ask myself if I am respecting my body um, because I've dealt with different injuries, um, especially with my back. And I constantly have to check in with that. How do I feel? So my creative work is uh, establishing healthy behaviors that are then filtering into my um, personal life, into my professional life. I'm constantly checking in on myself. So I think for people out there, um, find the things that can help you do that as well, that can then filter into your personal life and it will help you to be consistent with yourself. And I think consistency is very healthy. And if that's something you can practice with yourself, then it's something you can do with others. This is taking us to compassion. And this is when we start to understand the pain of the other and understand our own pain and try to transform it in a constructive way. Marcia, let's now talk about one topic that is um, misconceptions and stereotypes. Uh, you practice pole dance. Yes. And I think pole dance has also given you the opportunity and us as observers to understand that the body has uh, different ways of expression and society can put that movement into a box that can be outcast, misunderstood or miscalled. Uh, tell us about your experience as a pole dancer. Yes, um, so first I would like to say that I am very happy to answer questions like this because it's important to look at what we think is high art and low art. And I think we're learning to sort of um, not work in boxes like that anymore. Um, for myself, my journey in pole dancing started a few years ago. Um, and it's become something that I am very passionate about. It allows me to feel that I can express myself. Um, I often describe myself as someone who's maybe reserved, maybe not so much shy, but, but maybe reserved. And so it's quite surprising for people to see me um, doing pole dance because of the perceptions that they have. Um, and I'd like to say that there are so many different ways of moving in pole dance. It's sometimes referred to as pole art or pole sport. Um, you have people that have done ballet who move into pole dancing. You have um, exotic dancers who do pole dancing and that space should be respected as well because that is very difficult. The kind of tricks or things that they do um, and so I've had to uh, personally um, navigate people's perceptions around me being an educator and a pole dancer. For them to see those two things sit comfortably together is sometimes confusing. And I've had um, very positive responses mostly um, from other women who are interested in exploring themselves in the same way because what you see on um, social media platforms is uh, looks like perfection, but I want to say when you record yourself doing these routines, you record it maybe 10 times, and then you choose the, the best video where you've made no mistakes. And then people think, well, I don't have that body or how do I get to that level? And I'm very honest when I talk about my own journey in that I'll say, there's certain things I can do. And then there are other tricks that I need to work on a little bit more. I recorded this video maybe a couple of times and I posted the best one, or I'm struggling with an uh, injury right now and it will take me so much time to condition myself again. So when I talk about pole dance, I try to be very honest in that way. And I try to share content from other pole dancers who um, have different shaped bodies, who come from uh, maybe places like Egypt, uh, women who are nurses who do pole dance, women who wear the hijab who do pole dance, because I want this world to be open and accessible to many people. Marcia, 
I think it's a great way to end our conversation with a high note like this one that is saying no to stereotypes. <laughs> <laughs> to start and uh, i would ask you to please give us a message for the new generations in society in general regarding inclusion participation and diversity so i would say learn to advocate for yourself for your needs and that will teach you or remind you how to advocate for others I feel like that's what's most needed right now, um, that if you find out how to represent yourself, how to speak for yourself, and this is especially important for people of color, how to speak for yourself and your needs, um, that will open up your heart and it will allow you to be compassionate to other people who are needing their own spaces. Um, just allowing yourself to shine, to be beautiful, allows other people to see that and inspires them as well. So for myself, I feel just the need to advocate for each other. If young people can do that, um, it will be an amazing thing and it's what's most needed right now. Marcia, thank you so much for promoting unity and diversity and for your love for humanity. You know that you're very close to my heart and I send you all my love and looking forward to see your upcoming work and keep the connections around the world. Musical kisses and see you again. Thank you so much, Juani. Bye-bye, Marcia. Bye-bye.